one of, one of the one of the good things about this course is that there's always new stuff in the news about the course. So I want to read a couple of articles that just came out. This is from September 2nd. It's an article written by a Dr. Twinge, who's a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. His book is iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood. And this is what he says. In the past few years, many U.S. college campuses have become embroiled in controversies over free speech. Students have insisted on, quote, safe spaces, unquote, to protect themselves from ideas with which they disagree and have demanded the dismissal of faculty members who offend their sensibilities. Campus speakers have been disinvited when students object to the point of view. Such events were rare just five years ago, but now seem to occur constantly during the school year. Why has this happened? First, I generous, that's you. First, I generous, the generation of young Americans born in 1995 and first to spend their entire adolescence with smartphones in their hand, puzzling as the recent campus controversies might seem, they are rooted in the unique psychology and life experiences of their cohorts. First, I generous grew up in an era of smaller families and protective parenting. They rode in car seats until they were in middle school, bounced on soft surface playgrounds, and rarely walked home from school. For them, unsurprisingly, safety remains a priority even into early adulthood. This is distinctively an iGen idea that the world is an inherently dangerous place because every social interaction carries the risk of being hurt. To faculty administration who grew up in previous years, college is a place being challenged by new ideas. Members of iGen disagree. They see college as a place to prepare for a career in a safe environment. They don't necessarily see a connection between <coughs> participating in big social and political debates and getting a job that pays well. All of these iGen factors have combined to create a perfect storm at U.S. colleges. It isn't hard to see why these young people looking for safety and practically and practicality now clash so regularly with their elders when controversial ideas arrive on campus. There was recently a speaker who was uh, invited to speak in Williams College, which is in the Northeast. His name is Christina Summers. Let me tell you who she is. She was a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a member of the Board of Advisors of the Foundation of Individual Rights in Education, uh, she teaches ethics at Clark University, has published several books, including um, uh, articles and books published in the New York Journal of Medicine, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post. Uh, it, known for her defense of liberal feminism and her critique of gender feminism, her book, uh, The War Against Boys, is one of the New York Times notable books and has lectured in more than 100 colleges. She gave a talk. And the response to the talk was she was called a racist and a white supremacist. She was insulted by rants that consumed the majority of the question and answer period. After one st student shouted F you at the speaker, an administrator seemed to affirm the heckler's veto signaling that a time out gesture that it was time to end the event. Um, for each challenging question asked of her, there were at least five personal attacks directed either at her or at the uh, moderator. One student started yelling aggressively, blaming the moderator for, uh, for his parents' qualms about his sexual orientation. His rant lasted for at least five minutes. Other students stood up and exclaimed that they were better than the speaker because she was, quote, stupid, harmful, and a white supremacist. This was last week. At Brandeis University recently, Brandeis canceled a, a play about the comedian Lenny Bruce after some students and faculty expressed outrage about its content. Uh, one criticism was that the play unfairly portrayed the Black Lives Matter movement. A Brandeis theater student who led the campaign against the campaign told Boston Globe that it portrayed black characters with a ridiculous and vicious notion and they were caricatures. The plot centered around a main character who listened to audio recordings of Lenny Bruce. 
which sparked discussions of a racial epithet and how Bruce's material translated to contemporary time. Donald Trump Jr., the son of our president, recently gave a speech at the University of Texas on October 24th, and as reported by Mother Jones, um, he said, politically liberal professors and administrators foster an atmosphere that makes conservatives afraid to be vocal. Trump moved to the topic of free speech by citing conservative political commentator Ben Shapiro's recent speech at the University of California, Berkeley. While officials acknowledged he had a right to be on campus, they coddled students by offering mental health professionals <laughs> to talk about how the appearance of <coughs> impact their sense of safety and belonging on campus. That showed that liberal universities think conservative speech is equivalent to violence. And then Trump engaged in a mock dialogue between the liberals and the conservatives. Quote, free speech is all right with us, but it's hate speech we want to ban, the liberals say. We're all right. Well, that, you're right. Nobody likes hate speech, we tell them. But exactly what do you mean by hate speech? Trump said, oh, that's easy. The hate speech is anything that says America is a good country, that our founders were great people, that, they, that we need borders. Hate speech is anything faithful to the moral teachings of the Bible. Trump mocked the <coughs> arts conference, that's you, for preparing students for underwater basket weaving and feminism degrees not preparing them for the real world. Calling you all snowflakes. <laughs> so yesterday I looked up the definition of snowflake, not in Webster's Dictionary, but in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Here's what you are, according to the Urban Dictionary, assuming you're snowflake. Quote, a hypersensitive, irrational person who can't stand to have his or her worldviews challenged or be offended in any perceived or even slightest way. They will have any number of emotional reactions in human character and or motives. Blocking on social media, shouting, interrupting, threatening, assaulting, etc. They often live in an echo chamber of their own beliefs and surround themselves exclusively with people and opinions they agree with. The term is often used to describe people left-leaning but can also be applied to right-leaning people. And in one of the articles which you have in your materials that was written by Ehrlich Baer, who is the Vice Provost for Faculty, Arts, Humanities, and Diversity at New York University, he said the following. Widespread caricatures of students as overly sensitive, vulnerable, and entitled snowflakes is wrong. The recent student demonstrations at colleges, campuses against Milo Sinopoulos, which was here, and others should be understood as an attempt to ensure the conditions of free speech for a greater group of people rather than censorship. When those views invalidate the humanity of some people, they restrict speech as a public good. But it has regrettably been easy for commentators to create a simple dichotomy between a younger generation's oversensitivity and free speech as an absolute good that leads to the truth. We would do better to focus on a more sophisticated understanding. The idea of freedom of speech does not mean a blanket permission to say anything anybody thinks. It means balancing the inherent value of a given view with the obligations to ensure that other members of a given community can participate in this course as fully recognized members of the community. What is under severe attack in the name of an absolute notion of free speech are the rights, both legal and cultural, of minorities to participate in public discourse. The snowflakes sensed a good year before the election of President Trump that insults and direct threats could once again become sanctioned by the most powerful office in the land. What it, its proponents forget is that freedom of speech requires vigilant and continuous examination of its parameters, and unlike invoking a pure model of free speech that was never existed, the danger to our democracy is clear and present. We should thank the student protesters, the activists, and other overly sensitive souls for keeping watch over the soul of our republic. So, the question for you is, are you a snowflake? Let me start with Olivia. Are you a snowflake? No. Why? Why not? Um. Do you think Milo should have been allowed to come to uh, campus and yes. speak? You do. 
Um, and what should the school have done with regard to the protest against him, which broke windows and cost the school $100,000 in debt? You realize that the $100,000 that the school spends eventually comes down to your pockets because it's going to result in an increase in your cost and tuitions. So are you prepared to spend that money so that Miles gets to speak? Yes. Because? Um, well, for a few reasons. First of all, um, when we were reading our facts, like our case today, um, there was a lot about how you know, Heckler's veto and whether or not we should protect the speaker, protect the crowd. We've talked a lot about that in class. And um, I definitely think that you need to protect the speaker um, by maintaining the crowd and by making sure it doesn't become violent. Um, I think that because a lot of students on this campus, or even not students on this campus, are scared to hear what he had to say and didn't want to hear what he had to say, and based off of you know past precedent, think that by protesting or rioting or whatnot that they can stop him from speaking. And I think that like no matter what he's saying, he has the right to say it. Some of what he was going to say, according to himself, was that he was going to read the list of 10 students on campus who were actually here illegally, illegal immigrants. And by exposing these people at this time, given what the administration wants to do and Jeff Sessions wants to do, it would put them in, in danger of actually being taken from campus and being deported. Isn't that an act of violence through words? Should he be allowed to say that? If you know that's what he's going to do, and you're one of those vulnerable people, is it okay to let him show up and talk like that? I think yes, because if he's not allowed to say that, where do you draw the line of what's like emotional harm or what's not harming someone? And so he should be allowed to say that? Yes. And if, in fact, we want to create on campus, or some people want to create a neo-Nazi group, and they want to march on campus with um, swastikas stickers and uh, big signs, is that OK, too? Do we let them come on campus and talk? There was an article that said that when, when the Republican Party here, the Republican Club here, wanted to have a free speech week, the estimate would be that it would cost the university approximately $500,000 to protect the group of speakers. Eventually, it was canceled, but that was what it was. Is it okay to spend $500,000 to protect people who might be Nazis, neo-Nazis, KKK people? Is that okay? You pay for that? If they want to speak and people want them to speak on our campus, I, I think yes. Right. And if I decide that I want them to speak on campus and their <coughs> speak, their presence actually intimidates you and upsets you, what's your choice? Just look away, like Holmes' jacket, don't yeah. watch. Just don't look away. Yes. Do you think there's a difference between a Nazi speaking in Charlottesville and a Nazi coming on campus and speak? Is there any responsibility that the government has to protect college students that it might not have in the public square? What do you mean? When you come to a library to speak, when you go to the library to study, if somebody comes into the library and makes a lot of noise, we should stop that person. Right. Well, I mean, and it talks about in um, this packet, there are certain limitations, like, a, a circumstance of time. You know how we talked about you can't have, like... Time, place, and matters. Right? Yes, that okay. matters. Okay. And, and why is there such a thing as a time, place, and matter restriction? Why do you think? Because when you go to a library, the purpose of going to the library is to read library books. And the government, Cal, creates a space with library and library books where you should have the right to come and be comfortable and you should be quiet and you should do what it is that you come there to do. Correct? Okay. So nobody can come to speak. Isn't that the same when you come to Berkeley to study? No. When you come to learn? And if, in fact, a Nazi comes on campus or Milo's comes on campus to expose someone who is now to be the subject of deportation, don't you have the right to feel safe on Cal campus 
And doesn't the government have an obligation to provide a learning environment for you? I think the definition, which is something I found kind of hard to like really gain a definition for in this case, but um, like competition of ideas and um, having an academic environment, people really disagree on what that is. Um, and I think that it should be like all ideas. And you shouldn't have to be protected from a certain idea no matter how offensive or no matter how much you disagree with it, no matter how uncomfortable it might make you. I think that's when academic um, growth is made and when you can start pushing your ideas and becoming you know, more knowledgeable. I don't think it's going to be protected. So if you are put in fear of actually being deported or being objectified, just get over it. That's the answer. This, the, the government, Cal, has no obligation at all. Do they? I'm asking you, do they? <laughs> do they? Some people think they do, some people think they don't. What do you think? Is there no limit to any change, any limitation that, that Berkeley can impose upon any speaker based on the content of the speech? None. Is the time, place, and manner of speaking on a college campus exactly the same as speaking in the public square? Or should there be some different criteria? What do you think? I think that although the line is hard to draw, I would completely disagree and say that like, having names called out of people who could potentially be deported <coughs> in your speech, I don't think should be justified. I think the university is obligated to provide a space where students feel comfortable to learn and feel safe. And I'm not saying they should be protected from all speech that they disagree with. But when it puts them in danger, it prevents them from being able to feel comfortable in a classroom where they're supposed to study and supposed to get an education, or maybe even cause them to get deported and prevent them from getting that education, I don't think that should be allowed. Well, certainly I can stop somebody from speaking out in this classroom because this is my classroom and we're talking about a subject matter. If you decide to stand up and talk about a pro-Nazi theory, I can say that's not the topic and we can stop it. But what about in the public square? Should I be able to stop you in the public square? Yeah. I wouldn't say so, but at the same time, I think it's important to note that a lot of the reaction to Akmala's invitation or other speakers, it, it's not like people said, oh, he's going to read these names and it's going to incite violence or cause issues. It says, oh, he's a conservative who doesn't agree with oftentimes like, the general liberal ideology on campus, so that's why he shouldn't come. Or maybe not, that's not the reason, but that's oftentimes, you know, the reason that organizations like Antifa go out and put in Well, Well, Yiannopoulos makes his living demeaning people. That's what he does. He knows it, he says it, he right. sees himself as an entertainer, he says he is not threatening, but if you just read his words, they are very demeaning to people based upon characteristics of the people, race, color, gender, immigration. They are demeaning and attacking. He acknowledges that. He says, oh, this is just me talking, but you know what? If you're the object of that, that's upsetting. That's upsetting. And I would ask you, when Milos comes on campus, invited by a Berkeley group, and the university spends hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money so that he can speak and demean you and your fellow students, is that 100% okay? There's no limitation here at all? Specifically inciting violence, then there should be limitation, but... Yeah, but that begs the question, because when he comes on campus, how do you know what he's going to incite violence or not? And if he incites violence, whose job is it? Is it his job to keep quiet, or is it the government's job to stop the violence? Christian, please. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the idea of, like, the first moment is you can't stop someone from speaking, and so you should prosecute the people who actually do the violence, not the people who incite the violence. And I mean, this is the problem that I have with this particular instance, because it's like, the people who don't want my vote to speak, they're asking the state, or they're asking the government actor, in this case the university, to restrict him from coming. But yet his speech, in this case calling out documented students, as abhorrent as it is, is trying to incite not violence among other people, but it's inciting violence by the state to come and deport them. 
which is a legitimate, I mean, interest for the law. I mean, as unfortunate as it is, right? And so, but then this gets to the question of, well, is it illegal to actually be here? No. It was illegal to cross the border. That was the act that was illegal. It's not illegal to just be present in the United States. I mean, Alito addressed that. And so it's like, you know, this is the problem that I have, but it's like, he's inciting violence, but not necessarily among his supporters to act against these students. It's, he's asking, in this case, it would be ICE to come and deport them. And it doesn't matter if he says that here or in the public square or in a video that he posts on the internet. I mean, is there any difference? There? Okay, let me unpack it. First of all, to the individual who could be the object of that speech, does it matter, do you think, to that individual if it's the government who's going to incite the violence against the individual or the group of people around them? Or I might argue that to the individual who was going to be the object of the violence, the individual is the object of the violence, and it's a distinction without a difference to that individual as to who does it. Now, it may be a distinction on a legal sense of who does it, but I don't think that's a distinction that we're going to get a lot of mileage on. Where I would ask you to think about and consider is, I think you have a strong First Amendment argument if Miles gets a soapbox and stands up in a public square and says, let me give you a list of people I know here illegally, right? My question is, if you take that soapbox and with the permission of Cal, put him on campus and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect him, because you know it's going to be a problem, because it's happened already. There's already been a problem. It's going to happen again, right? And aren't you endorsing that speech? And to you, students who show up here, Someone spent a lot of money for you to be here. Maybe you did individually, maybe the state did, maybe a scholarship, I don't know who it is. But someone's paying a lot of money for you to come here to get some benefit. And if, if, if his speech, or a Nazi speech, or somebody else's speech makes you as an individual feel threatened, upset, victimized, the object of violence either from your neighbors or the government, isn't that a violation of the trust that the university has implicitly told you, come here and we will give you the opportunity to learn and protect you from this kind of stuff? Well, but that's not the point of the university. I mean, does that mean that, you can, that the university can censor the types of readings that you get? I'm asking, that's the question. Well, no, I mean, it's not permissible because, I mean, the university, I mean, there have been, it was Kate Fish versus University of Missouri, and then the other case involving involving the college Republicans at SFSU, it's like, this is university. I mean, number one, you're choosing to be here. It's not like secondary education. This is higher education. This is not compulsory. Um, so there are, you, there's a sense of um, like less security that you have as an individual. Yeah, you may be paying a lot to be here. Given on this is just a quote from one of the cases we read, Tinker. They said that speech should be allowed if if it does not interfere with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school and without causing the rights of others. But the court never tells you how to do that. The court never tells you where to draw a line. You think we should draw a line, right? Where do you draw a line? You're sitting now, you have the power, right? This case is before the court or before the, the school, and it's a split decision, you've got the vote. Tell me what you tell the Republican Club, the Democratic Club, and maybe the Neo-Nazi Club is their form, but the KKK Club is their form. What do you tell them about how to invite speakers and how not to invite speakers? Christian says everybody gets to come. Well, you, you don't think everybody gets to come. How do you decide it? Um, I think that's one of the things I don't know. That's a problem I can't decide that. Okay, good. You know that I don't care what you know, I care what you think. So what do you think? Think now. What do you do? Give me a a criteria. I think you have to look at what the speech is going to be expressing, and although, and I mean, I think you have to look at the idea of hate speech, um, and whether or not the speech will incite violence, whether it will. Um, I mean, there's that line. It's like. Yeah, you can offend someone, you can make someone feel uncomfortable, but that line between discomfort and extreme vulnerability to harm in some way, whether that be the government deporting you or 
making you go and commit suicide because you feel so, I mean, that, that line is very hard to draw, but I think that there is some way, maybe, that you can determine hate speech and, and you know, define that through some sort of language. Well, can you? I think you can. All right, and you want to give it a shot? If this was easy, it would have been done already. So trust me, this is not easy. I get it. It's not easy, but you have to decide it. Someone, because that's my next question is, who gets to decide? Do we get to decide for ourselves who we bring on campus or not? And if the answer is, if you don't like what he's going to say, don't show up, phone jacket, look away. Or do we, do we protect the vulnerable amongst us? and not permit anyone or any group of people to bring anybody here to say anything he or she wants? That's the question. Um, there's something in this case about how do you protect... Which case? Which one? Um, Tinker? No, it's, it's in one of the articles. Okay. Um, it's basically whether or not you protect the individual who is now the minority or do you protect the majority. And you know, then you think who's being the vulnerable one? Is it really all the uh, people who feel unsafe by something that's said, or the person that their rights might be taken away? And I think that the vulnerable person becomes the one that, like, their rights might be taken away if they can't speak. And I think that, like, you have to look at even though the majority might think something, like the minority speaker, or well, let's say it's you know Milo, or let's say it's the Republican group on campus. Their their right to free speech that shouldn't be abridged is like just as legitimate as another person's. So when you're trying to protect one group of people by potentially saying and censoring them and saying no, you can't say this, this is going to affect someone else, that's now taking away someone else's right. Okay, but if I come on campus with a big sign that says Muslims should not be allowed in the United States and certainly should not be on Berkeley campus. And every Muslim who sits in a seat in Berkeley takes away a seat from someone more deserving. Okay, that's speech. You should allow that. Yes. Okay, and the person who happens to be Muslim who came to Cal to get an education, what do you think that person is going to feel at that time? I think it's really unfortunate, and I think it's 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 not you know something that's just too bad on that person. But that person's I mean, speech rights are not being taken away. How do you, you know, she's trying to draw a line. How do you draw that line? It's so you can't, you can't. Well, the next, the first question is, do you draw a line? No. Then the next question is, where do you draw it? And the third one is, who gets to draw it? So you, your answer is, and Christian's answer is, yeah. you can't draw one, and so you don't draw one, right? What do you think? Um, I think, like, um, there's nothing. There's nothing intellectual about the, an opinion like that like there's i think the point of the university is to engage with an idea um like from a critical standpoint and have a discussion and have like a, a productive debate but certain views of like an obviously racist degree like that have no intellectual merit and cannot be engaged with like in a college classroom or like just to say that a muslim does not have any purpose here is so ruinous to someone's sense of self worth that it just it doesn't belong in terms of just like a university. People have the right and a university should prioritize the safety of its students over just like speech like that, I think. Right. And so the university makes a decision about whether or not speech is going to upset somebody or not and then speech should upset somebody. Um, I, I do think that there a line for sure needs to be drawn because obviously there's I mean, they try to make it like a liberal and conservative issue, but we're not talking about like a tax plan. It's talking about something that is like immediately destructive to someone's sense of belonging. Like to say that you don't belong in this country at this university, how can someone like, how can someone study under those circumstances? It's very difficult, but the question is how do you know what it is you have to say or can or can't say if the government is going to come to you and say, well, that's what I heard someone's feeling, you can't say it. Um, I thought the definition in the Berkeley speech code was pretty adequate. Okay, why? Um, just to say something that is so severe and, and pervasive and objectively offensive and that so substantially impairs a person's access to university programs or activities that the person is effectively denied equal access to the university's resources and opportunities on the basis of race, color, national or ethnic origin, alienage, sex, religion, sexual orientation, 
I, I would accept that. Good. Who gets to decide what speech is going to do that or not? The victim or the speaker or the government? Um, I think it would have to be the government. Okay. So the government is going to decide whether you can talk or not based upon how it affects somebody else. Isn't that a heck of a um, Aren't you losing your First Amendment right to speak because it's going to land poorly on somebody? Yes, but I don't have trouble with that. Because, Why? Because the First Amendment has been abridged in so many historical examples. Okay. Like, why, why does it become absolute in this context, but not in so many others? I don't know. I'm asking. So you permit Berkeley, the university, which is the government, to look at a speaker and based upon, of course, the history of what the speaker said, and say, no, this is going to hurt somebody who's here, a minority, let's say, a minority person, and we're going to stop you from speaking. And yes. that's okay. Yeah. The government can censor speech in advance of the speech because it may impair somebody's ability to learn at Cal. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that um, a, I'd like to disagree because I think that protecting someone's ability to speak, I oh, well, I don't think you can restrict someone's speech based on what you think they're going to say. For instance, with Milo, I don't think, regardless of any of the hate speech that he like knew he was going to put forth, unless he was <laughs> proposing a direct attack on individuals. Or follow through with that, like he was going to with undocumented students. I think that is the line for halting his speech, but I don't think he can restrict that before. Um, and I think it's. But let me ask you this question: How does the government know what he's going to say until he says it? That's my. Well, what do you think? Well, I think we we discussed this. I mean, you could look at prior speeches and stuff. I don't think you know what someone's going to say before they're up there. Speaking. So you got to let them speak in any way. Yes, but you. I think that. The government or whatever the authority in that situation is holds the right to stop someone's speech. I think we used Neil as an example earlier this semester, and we're talking about a loaded gun versus a list of undocumented students. If you see someone holding a loaded gun, you have the right to stop them from having it. Right. If you see someone with a list of undocumented students, you have the right to stop them. What's the difference between me holding a gun and pointing it at you and Milo speaking? What's the constitutional difference? <laughs> Do I have a constitution to take the right to hold it down point of view? No, I'm, I, this is where I personally believe the line should be drawn. Go ahead. Where should country. it be drawn? It should be drawn when your speech directly incites violence towards another individual. And it's the government's responsibility to stop the speech, not to protect the person from being the object of violence. Well, in this case, the government is the one who would harm. Okay, right. yes, I think it is the government's job because Cal, in this case, is acting as the government and Cal has made a promise to undocumented students to protect them. Um, and so it is Cal's responsibility. And protect their feelings and protect them. No, not protect safety. their feelings, protect their physical ability to be in this country. Or somebody who has a big sign that says Muslims don't belong in this country, but you're a Muslim and you're here legally. I okay. think I think that is okay. I think the important the thing that resonated me the most with what we read was the article by the ACLU um, about how restricting hate speech on campuses does nothing but kind of patch over the symptoms of a bigger problem, which is that our country is extremely racist and bigoted. Um, and so, if we don't allow those viewpoints to be expressed, if we pretend they don't exist. We're just doing everyone a disservice. But I think the important thing that the university can do in response. Um, another thing that really resonated me with was the idea that by devaluing someone else's humanity, you are effectively removing their right to speech in, in that you're removing them from like the sphere. Um, so if you're telling an undocumented student they don't belong here, you're devaluing them from the community and removing their right to speech. I think the correct response would be to help those people be put on a level playing field so that their speech is valued as much as the person who is devaluing their humanity. But the person who's here, let's say illegally, how yeah. is that person's speech being infringed upon by Yuck Milo or somebody saying they don't belong? But I think it's the broader idea, not their speech, but the broader <laughs> idea that they, their humanity is less valuable, and so their ability to participate in the public sphere of speech is undermined. So you would limit that speech on campus, correct? No. You would not limit it? No, I'm, I'm saying I don't think that speech should be limited. I think the speech of those people whose lives are being devalued That's should be... No, I don't think it should be limited. I think it should be, like, fostered. All right. So you should foster the speech of the people who say undocumented people should go home when Muslims don't belong in this country. That speech is okay on campus. 
That speech is okay on campus. You should foster the speech of the undocumented students. Right. Is there any speech on campus that you would say doesn't belong on campus? That that it's explicitly attacks individuals. How it, and, and saying to somebody, calling out the names of ten people who are here illegally doesn't just personally attack those people. I do think it personally attacks individuals. So can they have that speech? They can have that speaker. I think they should stop that speech before. Well, when you say that they, you see, that's the point. Who's they? The university should be allowed to invite whatever speaker students want to come and speak. For instance, Milo. Uh, I think if he got up there and was holding a list of students, the university should stop them from speaking at that point. Basically, unplug the microphone. They've done it when he's been heckled. I understand that. I'm asking if you think yes, that's okay. I do Physically, unplug the microphone. And when Louis Farrakhan came a couple of years ago, who has said in other contexts the only thing wrong with Hitler is that he didn't kill enough Jews, that's okay too for him to come and say that. And we should encourage <laughs> people to speak out against him, right? Yes. And there is no limit to what anybody can say. And, and if you can say it in the public square, you ought to be able to say it in front of campus. Besides, like, personal attacks. You see, but, but yeah. here's the problem, okay? In concept and broad theory, of course, we shouldn't attack people, it's a bad thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But someone has to decide which speech does that and which speech doesn't. And the someone who decides that is the government. And my question is, is that okay to have the government look at what someone's going to say and say, this speech is okay and this speech is not okay? Maybe it is okay to do that. Maybe it's not okay to do that. Where I'm trying to take you is, that it's, you can't just say, we shouldn't be saying these things. I agree with you, maybe we shouldn't. But when someone wants to say these things, is it the government's right, obligation, duty, power to say you can't speak because of how it's going to affect that person? And the second part of that question is, is, is there a distinction between on a soapbox in the public square and on a soapbox at Sproul Plaza? Maybe there is a name, maybe there isn't, but I'm asking you to understand that that's the issue. Yeah. I think it's also important to note that it's easy to discount these opinions as extremists. Like if a person comes on campus, like Milo, for example, I mean, Milo, as he claims, is like on a pretty extreme side, but speakers, for example, who advocate for abortion rights, or uh, pro life, who are very pro life, for example, um, and come on campus and people protest and say, oh, they have no right, it's hateful, you know, inciting violence. But at the same time, it's important to remember, it, sure, it can be disagreed upon that 50% of the country staunchly agrees that they're right um, and have the right to speak about you know, pro-life values and it's something that should be instilled in students. So I think it's also important to note that personal opinion is one thing, but it's easy to flip it the other way and have, you know, as we were talking about, I think the same thing that you take away can be taken away from you. Right. So here's what I'm not going to hand. I want you to make a decision, right? Of course, we should all be nice to each other and say nice things, and I, yes, I agree with you. But here you have a very specific circumstance. You've got the First Amendment, and you've got the government, Berkeley, and you've got a speaker. And the question is not whether or not a speaker should or shouldn't say something. It's whether or not the government, Berkeley, should stop someone from speaking because of the effect that the words will have on someone else. And that's the question. And what is your answer, yes or no? No. It should not. So all speech is good on campus and the same way that it's good out there. And in the same way out in the world, if I threaten to kill you, I should be stopped. And if I do it on campus, I should be stopped. But if I say Muslims don't belong in this country, like the President of the United States was right to say that, that speech is okay on campus as well. Right. And people can disagree and people can have protests against it peacefully, but it's, but it's okay, okay to do that. Have. So all speech is good. It doesn't change once you come on campus, correct? As long as it doesn't explicitly incite violence against individuals, in which case the government has okay. the control of the There's a distinction between inciting violence against individuals by a third party and inciting violence in the crowd. I don't think anyone disagrees that if you create a violence, like yelling fire falsely in a crowd of theater, creates a violent response which is false. But that's not the same as saying something about somebody that someone else is going to create a violent circumstance or not. That's my question. Thomas, you seem to um, have a view on that. 
Yeah, I, and also I, I want to say that like I don't really like I'm not really comfortable with the government restricting any speech. Like for example, with flag burning, one of the justices was like, "Oh, it just demoralizes the troops," and then some. But like you can't just you can't just make excuses. Like you have to allow the speech. Any speech. Any. It doesn't matter what they say. Yes. Neo Nazis can come on and say whatever they want to say. Yeah. The Ku Klux Klan can come on and march down the streets and say anything they want on campus. Yes. And there's no restriction on speech on Berkeley campus that don't exist in the public square. Yes. And the fact that it offends a student who came here to study makes that person feel unwanted, threatened, concerned, victimized, just too bad, get over it. Yes. If, and if someone's offended on the street, we don't have to protect that, am I right? Well, the diff that's right. And here, that's my question. My question is, does that change when that per when that speech is on a college campus? Right. And you say no. Is that yeah, right? because the campus is a government organization, a government entity. So is a library. <clears throat> yeah, but like that's the, it's a content neutral restriction. That's not content neutral. Right. right. So you're saying that content neutral restrictions <coughs> are fine in any circumstance, but but content but the government should never limit content. Right. And if the Antifa or anybody else comes to protest, it's the job of the government to stop the protest and let the speaker speak. Yes. Even if it costs five hundred thousand dollars to do that, it's of your money. It's illegal to break windows, so we arrest people to break windows. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Just, just as an aside, by the way, this is a picture I put in of the Hector Vito. Does anybody recognize where this came from? By the way, this is uh, from from the film Frankenstein. This is the Frankenstein mob <laughs> coming to get Frankenstein. So the Hector. Anyway, yeah. So. So, we've been talking constantly about the government stopping someone, like stopping whatever. So, what what if, so let's say, let's take this part, Richard Spencer, literally advocating for genocide here. Richard Spencer is here. One Richard Spencer with a microphone versus a hundred, like, Berkeley students. They're not fighting, but it's just like, there's like a line drawn between them or whatever, and then they're just shouting at each other. And the Berkeley students drown out Richard Spencer because they just have a lot more people, right? So they just drown his voice out. Is that <coughs> does that count as restrict restricting your free speech, or does or does that not? Because there's no, it's just like two groups speaking at each other. And they're just okay. So here, that is the heckler's veto, right? I don't like what you're saying. I'm going to heckle you and and prevent you from speaking. Okay. In that circumstance, the heckler is other listener. Okay, the question we have is, is, what is the responsibility of the government in that circumstance? Is it the responsibility of the government to stop the heckler, or is it the responsibility of the government to get Ricky Spencer off the stage? So I, in both cases, you're, no matter what you're doing, you're restricting someone's speech. I yes, think you because, are. Yeah, because you're either restricting the speech of the speaker by telling him to stop, or you're restricting right. the speech of the people that are reacting to not do whatever, then it's just yeah, but you see that's, that's exactly so I'm thinking, the issue. So I, I think government out. Just let them let the two of them speak as long as they don't punch each other in the face or burn down a building or whatever, let them let them out. Okay. So here you are on college campus on Berkeley. And Spencer or Milos or Ann Coulter or any of these people or Louis Farrah can't come to speak. And there's a whole group of students who don't want him to speak or her to speak because of the content of the speech. And the response is to not let that person speak by heckling. Okay. And your argument is that the government should just remain neutral, make sure nobody does any physical violence to the other person. Yes, because either way you are restricting someone's ability to speak. And it's and it's the government's responsibility to just get out of the way. And so the loudest voice gets to be heard, and the minority voice doesn't get to be heard. And there's no obligation of the government to allow minority views to be expressed. No, that's 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 a different thing. It's like, but isn't that the net result that whoever speaks loudest gets to talk, and whoever doesn't speak loudest doesn't get to talk? Well, maybe that's okay, yeah. and maybe yeah, that's okay. your decision. So, so but got, I want so got, to know. So, so yeah. So if that's happening. Um, <coughs> Wait, I read this let me one. stop you here. It's not if that's happening. Right, when that happens. That, that is happening. Right? That is happening. When that happens, 
I think that the only time that we should let that happen is if the top of the speaker or of, of whoever, either the majority or the minority, produces a, like produces like something or has the high capability of producing um, something what's it? It's called the paradox of tolerance. It's like you can't let intolerant people you can't let intolerant people gain the majority or else tolerance is destroyed and then the intolerant win and then tolerance doesn't exist at all. Okay. But that's a philosophical statement that I will agree with you. But now you have to implement it. And somebody or some power has to make a decision in advance about which speech is tolerant and which is intolerant. <laughs> And the only people who can make that decision is the government. And my question is, do you want the government to make that decision? Do you want Donald Trump's administration to make a decision about which speech is tolerant and which is intolerant? Because if you say, this is my philosophy and I want it implemented by governmental force, then that's what you're deciding. Maybe that's what you are deciding. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't decide it. I just want you to know that that's the decision. And philosophically, these are wonderful comments and wonderful conversations, and we ought to have them. But then you have to translate it into someone has to do something. And the someone, whether it's Berkeley administration or the federal government or the state government, has to act. And you have to instruct them on what to do and what the parameters are. And my question is, what do you instruct them to do? Yeah. I just remembered something, because um, we were talking about, like, you know, there's a lot of this surveillance yeah. um, and I was just remembering um, after Ben Shapiro came to speak, I was watching a video on YouTube of the protesters outside and someone, I don't know, a TV host um, was going around and asking them what they were protesting. And I think it's important to like realize to like the context and history of like birth and the people who come here to protest. Like sometimes I would argue that it is not the minorities that are trying to protest and have their voices heard. It's the very extremist groups on both ends of the spectrum, like in Oakland and Berkeley, who are coming really to incite violence and to get um, like their community attention. And some of them didn't even know who were coming to speak. They were protesting for the sake of protest. <laughs> I think that's also like, in, like something to keep in mind is like we keep talking about like, oh, like are you willing to like pay like half a million dollars like? You know, that's coming out of your tuition to protect these speakers, but I think it's important to also acknowledge that in the first place that the reason why we need to protect the speakers is because there are people who are burnt out our campus and who are inciting violence like in the first place. So, so the <laughs> decision is that it's the government Berkeley's responsibility to protect the speakers regardless of why they're in the Um, I mean I agree that if someone a speaker is making like a direct attack on someone. See, but you don't know what they're gonna say until they come here and say. Well, I think a lot of the times, there's, well, people, like, speakers like me, like, have a different opinion on groups, but, like, for example, calling out specific, like, people, like, to be deported is, like, a direct attack on someone. But, for example, someone saying, like, if someone's this broad saying, you know, Muslim should be here, I think is interesting. Um, there was this, somewhere in the readings that said, like, the best way to combat hate speech is with more speech. And I think, like, obviously that's a very, like, also, it's important to know that when people make very extremist views that I would say the majority don't agree with, like Muslims don't fully like, belong in this country, that you can't argue with someone who's not willing to listen. And if someone like goes into like a Muslim theme house and says, you don't belong here, like I think they should for sure be removed. I'm sure they'd be asked to remove. They'd be called, like the cops would be called on them. But if they're just in this realm, the only thing is, um, like, you, like you're not living in this realm. So. So, so you're right, and philosophically, I accept everything you say, okay? But now you have to make a decision. You are the government, you are the, the, the Chancellor of Berkeley, you're the President of the United States, you're somebody in power, and you have to make a decision. Does this speaker go on the campus or not? And do you have a set of criteria based upon what the speaker is going to say? Or do you say everybody gets to speak, and if there is violence, I'll deal with the violence? Yes. Which one? Go with the latter. You, you let everybody come on regardless of who they are and what they're going to say. Yes, except I think it's interesting to do that. Like, I think Miles should have been allowed to come the first time, like, back in February. But, like, well, he, was allowed he had a real purpose to come back to specifically incite violence and to specifically attack certain people. And I think that's where the school could draw the line. So would you draw the line and say, no, you can't have Miles come back? The second time, yes. Yeah, you would, because of... If he had made, like, specific, like, remarks that he was going to, like, specifically attack individuals. Not and, like, attack them, violence. if you're not exposed well, was he super angry? I wasn't like, here in February. Okay. So, but wasn't he really angry that he wasn't allowed to come speak, and so he was 
maybe yes. talk to the neighbor like that. I'm of course going to come and do X, Y, and Z. Do we care whether or not a speaker is angry or not when we make decisions about whether we let the speaker come on up? Is it about what the speaker feels or is it about what the listeners feel? Or is it about everybody for them, his and herself? Because that's a decision you got to make. That's a decision. And, and not knowing, as I've said before, that's the beginning of wisdom. Knowing what you don't know. I think in a, in a perfect world where there's like good speech and bad speech, or like racist speech, not racist speech, you can narrowly draw a line um, of what's allowed and what's not. But since we don't live in that world, I don't think uh, speech code can do that without seeming so vague um, and without having all of these problems. Um, and I acknowledge that a lot of speakers are not promoting a peaceful discourse, and some of the speech might not be productive, but I don't think legally you can expose that. So your answer <laughs> as the person in charge of who gets to vote on Berkeley or not is you let everybody come? Yeah. Regardless? Yeah. And if there's a riot, you protect the speaker and stop the riot? Yeah. Even if the speaker is going to say things which are materially harmful to an individual or oppress the individual or say you don't belong on campus and make that person feel less wanted, less able to get the education he or she is entitled to get by coming here. I think I would morally um, like object to what they're saying, but I don't think you, I, I think you have to protect them in okay. that case. The speaker? Yes. So if I'm a, a Muslim student or an undocumented person and I come to you and you're the administrator, you get to decide who comes and I say, look, if you let that person come, it's going to be painful to me, harmful to me, upsetting to me. It's going to be hard for me to come to this class. It's going to be hard for me to learn. I came here. Someone's paying a lot of money. How can you let this happen to me? Your answer is get over it. Uh, well, if they were coming to me, uh, it's kind of, I think it's a little bit different because, it's like, to you, it would probably, uh, I, well, first, yeah, it's really it's kind of complicated. But that's the but, problem, yeah. you see. It's easy to <laughs> philosophize about what we should do and we should be nice and love each other and not hate each other. And I agree with you. Nobody would disagree with you. But, but, but then there comes the moment in time where the person in power, here it's the government, has to decide something. Let that person speak and spend a half a million dollars to protect that speaker of your money. Or stop the person to speak because your obligations to everybody is going to be offended. And that's the decision. And that decision implicates here the First Amendment and the cases that we read. And that's what you're going to have to decide. Yeah. <laughs> well, just like, I agree with the idea that if it's directly targeted at someone, then you can prevent it, like, preemptively. With Milo, he explicitly said that he had a list of people and he was going to expose them. And I think that's almost equivalent of like having a loaded gun. It's a threat that like, is very clear. Obviously, you don't know for a lot of speakers what they're going to say and like the ramifications of the speech. But if you explicitly say beforehand, like, this is my intention, this is what I'm going to do, I think he had the right to limit it. And I think that the overarching goal of universities is to foster safety and to between having some offensive speech and having speech that directly violates someone's ability to learn and to go to class. So I think that's where we draw the line. Okay, so Richard uh, Richard Spencer is invited to come to Cal. And amongst the other things he said, which I've reprinted, is uh, in thinking about immigration and migration, I could not care less whether someone filled out the paperwork correctly or passed the civic exam. I oppose the immigration of an African who waits his turn and genuinely wants to be an American. Conversely, I would gladly accept thousands of Swedish boat people who wash up on our shore. You let him speak? Very attacking on a group of identifiable people who come to this campus and are on Cal. It's very attacking on them. You let him speak? I mean, I don't think he's directly targeting me. What if he does name, and I have a list of all the African Americans that were here, and I'm going to read it all. Well, you don't have to read it all, it's pretty clear what they are. It's directly attacking a group of people based upon an identifiable, coherent characteristic of who they are as human beings. You let him speak? Then I wouldn't let him speak. You wouldn't let him speak because? Because it would, I think the government has an interest in protecting those people who would be inhibited by his speech to uh, like fulfill the function of the university. Like they are going to class, they're learning. The goal of the university mission is to teach them to be enlightened, and if 
that speech is bringing that in here, then it should be and, and the government gets to decide which speech is or isn't it. I think it can. Well, no, I'm, you're, you're in charge right now. You've got to decide. You're letting come on up. The Republican club, well, I shouldn't say that. Some clubs, the all right club, somebody wants to invite him on campus to speak. You know what he says. We don't know secret. You let him come? Yes, you come? No, you're not going to come. You know, and the reason you're not going to come is because the speech is going to offend certain individuals. Well, not only offend, but prohibit them from hearing statements and going to their class and doing what they came here to do. Right. So any speech that's going to upset an individual on this campus from getting the full ability to participate should be banned from coming on campus. And the government gets to decide that speech before the speech is actually published. I think you have to factor in the degrees of the speech. Well, but you need to tell me what, how you do that. That's right. How do you do that? Well, I feel like if certain teachers have like a track record of specifically singling out people or exciting some sort of violence to their speech, then that's a way of saying this speech should be prohibited versus other speeches where uh, maybe they're saying offensive things, but it's not directly making anyone feel like they can't go to class. Like there's an unsafe environment. I think there's a difference between offending people and creating violence and unsafety. And who gets to decide what that difference is? And they get to decide who it is. I'm going to suggest to you there's a difference between standing in front of a group of people and say, African Americans don't belong here, there's one of them, let's go get them, and saying, I don't think African Americans belong here. One is directly inciting violence against an, an identified person, the other is expressing an opinion. Do you see the distinction? Yeah. You make that distinction. Because I don't think that Spencer is saying anything other than this is my personal belief about this country and how it should be constituted. And that he shouldn't be allowed to speak. Well, I guess then he should be allowed to speak if he's not directly causing violence. But how do you know what he's saying? Well, and if okay. I am in the audience, Right? And I'm a white European male, and I hear you speak, and I get to be so upset that I go to get a baseball bat and go try to find an African American. Hasn't he incited me to want to? I think that personally, of course, you want to draw that line, and, but that you just can't be done. I don't think it's possible, essentially, that even though you know, there are these kinds of scenarios of fiction where you're directly calling out someone's name, but well, I can bring back to this idea that the public square and the soapbox is inherently different on campus than being on foul or having to take your hands to call or review it because it, as you keep saying, it does come back to the student tradition. And it's something that has, has been a reaction to that. And that be now they can allow you to have a speaker if there are any more than 50 students without one of the departments on campus backing you and accepting responsibility for that. You know it's going to cause damage and you know it's going to cause violence and regardless of what the student body reaction is because we've seen so many times that groups from all over the East Bay area come to campus when this happens. Um, and I think I think maybe that we have to have instead someone willing to accept the ramifications of what of someone has to be whoever's making this decision has to be okay to accept that. And I think that would actually deter people from inviting them because they don't want to be responsible for that. Or responsible for what? You know, when they set a tree on fell on fire and break the windows in the ASCC MLK building. And so if I invite you to speak and you create a reaction to someone breaks the window, I'm responsible for what someone else did because of what you said? No, no, no. You're not, it's not like your fault directly, but I think this idea that we're spending half a month, or the free speech we think we're spending half a million dollars, and that because the people who are in that, or I don't know that, that, that the idea that we're getting this is that you, as the person who's inviting them, is not actually responsible for paying for the security of that and getting, you know, the UC San Diego and UC to come all the way up. Um, someone has to pay for that, and I don't think it's fair that it's the students who feel attacked that have to do it. So, so you can invite, I can invite anybody I want to speak as long as I pay for the security to permit them to speak. That's the criteria. 
So that kind of eliminates minorities from inviting controversial speakers on campus, doesn't it? I don't have the money. I mean, the students, they're like you. They don't have money. They don't have a half a million dollars lying around. And then that's why you do it public, somewhere in the public square. Yeah, but, 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 but why should I, as a student on Cal, be limited to who I want to have on campus to talk to me because I can't afford to pay for the police? <coughs> Isn't it the government's responsibility to do that? Unless the speech is bad speech. Right, and we, we've read some cases about what is bad speech, physically threatening somebody, fighting words, uh, falsely yelling fire in a theater. But this is his opinion. He has an opinion. This is what his opinion about what this country ought to be. We have a president who has an opinion of what this country should be. You've got an attorney general has an opinion. We've got everybody who's got opinions of what this country should be. But if that person comes to a campus which would create a negative reaction, we ban that speaker because the invitor of the speaker can't afford to pay for the police. Well, I... Maybe you do. I'm not saying you don't. What I'm saying to you is that when you make that decision, you need to know that's the decision you're making. The end <laughs> result is that a lot of people don't come together to speak. Maybe that's okay. But, but when you say that, what you say, you have to know that's what it is that's going to happen. Um, I think that the government of the university can never like make assumptions. And then that is, it is never the right thing to do because you never know what the person is actually going to say and then you know they can flip immediately and say the opposite thing and whatever they want. I think the university or the state cannot step in until there's something that is imminent law is actually going to happen. And then that, you know, the university's responsibility is one of keeping the students safe, but at the same time you cannot deny students because because freedom of speech is the right to make that speech and the right to an audience. So you, by removing a speaker in a way that you're also taking away some students' right, like if you actually want to hear the speech, you're taking away those students' right to listen to that speech. And then that it is never okay until you know something really bad happens, people start punching each other, things start burning down. I think at that point the university can step in. And then if there's any particular students that feel uncomfortable about the speech, you know, the university should, you know, do something afterwards to direct personal attention to them that, you know, to reassure that they are safe on campus. So so Christian would say you punish the people who throw the bombs or punch, you don't punish the people who speak, right? Is that what you would say? You punish the people who do the violence. Violence is against the law. You create violence, go arrest the people who are violent. Why are you stopping me from speaking? I have a First Amendment protected right. Congress shall make no laws that should be right of speech. Congress is the government. The government is first and first. It is now limited. You can't speak because someone else is going to be violent. First, well, I, just, I don't want to speak for you, but. Yeah. The person who comes on the campus and has a sign that says Muslims should be violent. <laughs> I wouldn't call that harassment unless that speaker was actually following that student around and like telling that like you are not allowed here. And furthermore, the campus and the university is not endorsing that speech. Rather, they're endorsing the right to speak. If they were endorsing that speech, then they would expel Muslim students for being Muslim. That's just my view. And then finally, I think all of this, like this whole discussion can be resolved in terms of like the content of my little speech. Um, with RAV versus like St. Paul, because in that the court unanimously ruled that an ordinance or statute of any kind cannot prohibit otherwise permitted speech solely on the basis of the subjects of the speech. And so, in this instance, as unfortunate as it is, and unfortunate um, that Milo wants to target these people, no state actor can limit speech based on the subject. In this case, it would be the undocumented immigrants. And so this whole idea that, you know, he can be restricted, I mean, I don't know, I mean, the university in this instance, being that it's a public university, is a state actor, and so it cannot limit that. And this whole discussion of, like, harassment and being protected on the basis of blah, 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 the court has said, so sorry, you know, unless you're being, like, unless there's a clear present nature in terms of, like, you are being followed around, you cannot restrict that speech. Similarly, if someone came to campus and said, faggots need to go to hell, I may be offended, but unless those people are following me as a gay man and following me to class and trying to stop me from entering that class, 
they have the right to speak until they try and hit inhibit my ability to go to class, participate in you know learning. So I could come on campus and speak in a university um, in, in Dellenbach Hall and say things, and that's okay. But if I go out into school and you happen to be there and it offends you, then I shouldn't. So physical location. Like no, but you have to walk through it to get here. Well, so you walk around. I mean, that, like you just like. So you can avoid the speech, regardless of how offensive it may be. Avoid it. That's the job. The government well, has yeah, no. You have Cohen, you know, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking. So, so if you're offended by someone's speech, if one is offended by someone's speech on campus, the answer is don't listen. Yeah. Period. Uh, you know, I, I want to, I yeah, want to, it's certainly an easy it. decision, so everybody gets to come on campus. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you just also, you need to flip it. What about the counterfactual? What if someone feels, you know, like, what if some, I mean, some, I mean, and I'm sure there are people that feel this way because, I mean, we have Trump's president. What if someone says, well, your speech really offends me as a white man, and I really don't want you to speak. I mean, are you going to let that person speak? I don't know. So the, the, the question, you know, all right, the question is, is, whether or not the right to speak is different from the public square and Berkeley campus. And I'm getting the sense that your argument is it's not. Unless different. you are in the classroom, or unless you are blocking my ability to get to a classroom. I mean, or physically blocked. Or you're blocking my access to resources. And mm -hmm. is there any resource on Sprout Hall, or in Sprout Hall? Yes. Is there any resource in Sprout Plaza? No. So any words. Unless there are counselors that are like, come over here, I'll counsel you on Sprout Plaza. Like you're not being restricted to any resource that the university provides. So speech and words and in and of themselves on campus should be subject to the same restrictions as speech and words that are in the public square. And it's the government's responsibility to allow the speaker to speak. It's well, I don't no, I wouldn't say that the government has, is the one that has to no, you have to let them speak. But I'm just saying that you cannot restrict them from doing it. See, but that's a distinction without a difference, because unless the government is going to put resources into Cal and protect Spencer from speaking, he's not going to be permitted to speak because he's going to be heckled. And so well, if, if he's you, being heckled, well, you, but then we get back to this point, which was like, if you've got <coughs> hecklers and they're trying to, I mean, they're not trying to stop him from speaking, they're just trying to speak over him. Oh, I think they're absolutely trying to stop him. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, well, then that's a different, that's a different scenario. If the hecklers are trying to say, you cannot speak here, that's not permissible. But if the hecklers are present, and if the hecklers are just speaking over him, I mean, there's no for him. I mean, he should just give a microphone. Like, I don't you know, that's different. Yeah, but, but, but the net result is the same. I come on campus to speak. A group of people don't like what I'm going to say. They prohibit me from communicating my ideas. And your no, answer is the government has nothing to do with that. You're still speaking. If but someone really wants to listen to you, they just have to go up really close to you and listen to what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, again, it's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, look, not knowing <laughs> these are not simple stuff. Of course, this is hard. You, it's very hard, and and but it's very hard. Yeah. And if I'm Milo's, I'm Milo's, and I get invited to speak, and I come up on the stage and I'm speaking, or I'm Spencer and I get invited, I get up on the stage and speak, and hundreds of students are screaming and yelling so that I cannot communicate, or cursing at me, or the people who are as they've done in other campuses. And the government sits there and says, well, you know, speech is speech is speech. You're really allowing a heckler to veto. And the question is, is I have a First Amendment right to speak. I have a First Amendment right to express an opinion. The government, through its inaction, is not allowing me to exercise that right. What is the right power of the government? One could argue, and I get the argument, that as long as it's just words, it's a, it's a competition of words, it's just we're not going to intervene. I get the argument. My question is, is that what you want the government to do or not? That's the question. Well, That's no, not the in, answer. In okay. regards to the first time that Congress shall make no law. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, too bad. You just gotta, the state has to just sort of, you know, hands off. Like, let the heck with veto go. I don't know, you know, that's... Well, not knowing is the star of wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, I actually probably, I would disagree with the fact that there are no student resources on Sproul. I think it's driven with them and I'm in bargain with them like every time I walk through it. Um, it's very different. I think Sproul Plaza is very different than the public square because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a student sphere. It's people are walking through it every day. Saying something there has pretty significant outreach in the Berkeley community. And I think that the government needs to take on the responsibility of limiting speakers before they come because 
Um, I think it's pretty foolish to just overlook the track record of the speakers who are coming. Like we have a pretty good understanding of their platform. Um, of you the things that's that they, they were said. inviting. I know, I know, I know. But the thing is, with that with that platform in mind, they're coming to Berkeley for a reason because it's. It's it's a total instigation tactic. Like they're political agitators, and they know that Berkeley, as this like quote unquote liberal institution, right. is going to react very strongly. And then they can flip that kind of reaction from students and protesters um, to kind of cast a, a shadow on liberals, like prohibiting free speech in the media. So it works. It works. It works against. Um, it works against kind of what's best by having these people come. So I think the government needs to they need to step in because it's not just it's not just verbal speech. It's not just like a conversation. It's it's going to incite violence. We know it's going to do that. So And that the government's job is to stop the speech, not stop the violence. Um, yes, because I think the speech and, and the government and the violence are immediately related. So the Ku Klux Klan wants to put up a, a table in Sproul Plaza, you prohibit that. I would. And the Nazis you prohibit that. Yes. Okay. And just because you raised the issue of the Berkeley Campus Code of Student Conduct, which you supported, one of the things talked about off-campus, off-campus conduct, and I'm going to read it. Student conduct that occurs off-university property is subject to the code where it, has, where it affects the health, safety, or security of any other member of the university community or the mission of the university. So just because you're a student in Berkeley, the code affects you even when you're off campus. You okay with that? That good? Um, it depends. Like, what well, it depends on which way. I guess I, I think I think in terms of talking about who can and can't speak, it's immediately related to the college campus. You see, but but you can't say it depends on that. You can't do that. Well, you can't. I'm not going to let you do that because okay. you can't get away with that because somebody, the government, the university has to decide in advance, do I let that person come? Do I let Spencer show up and talk? Or do I and get a lot of cops to prevent violence at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money? Or do I not let that person speak? Or do I say to the people who invited that person, you've got to post a $100,000, $500,000 bond, which effectively means they can't speak. So that's the decision. We're not talking about what's good and right and fair and proper. Yeah. We're talking about a decision that has to be made in advance of the speech to permit it or not, and whether or not you permit it or not. I think, I think if, if the Berkeley College Republicans or whoever is organizing these events if they want to go to Martin Luther King Park down south of, or by Shattuck and they want to have the same kind of speech and rally, then that's totally fine. But What's the difference between doing it there and doing it here? Because on the college campus immediately infringes on the rights of all the other students. All the snowflakes. All the snowflakes <laughs> who are paying. Who are so your right to speak, one's right to speak and be protected, government protected, depends upon where you speak. Yes. And that this distinction is not a time, place, and matter distinction, it's a content based distinction. I think it can be a content based no, it has, decision. It either is or it isn't. No, it is on a college campus. It's a content based decision. Yes. And the government is okay on Berkeley campus to censor, to prohibit speech based on its content. And that content, that distinction, that content base is described in advance to the government how. Um, I just think it's it's within the scope of the First Amendment and like in accordance with this like sweeping historical trend to limit content-based speech on the college campus. Okay, but but I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna let you get rid of that because you've got to tell me and I run this campus whether or not I let the speaker on or not, and you're telling me it's okay for me to make that distinction based on the content, and I'm asking you how do I judge the content? Um, because that's what I have to do. I have to say this person speaks and that person doesn't because of content. Spencer gets to not speak, for example, and Farrakhan does, it's all on the content. I don't know yeah. that you can answer that question, but I am suggesting to you that that's the question that has to be no, answered. No, it is, but we, like, we still know what Richard Spencer represents. We absolutely know. He makes yeah. it clear. And he's being invited because of what you represent. It's not like they're inviting a non-known quantity to come up and let's see what he has to say. You know what he thinks. We know what he has yeah. to say. We know it. Too bad, don't come. Um, 
Yeah, I know, I know it's I know it's really hazy, and I guess kind of idealistic to think we can draw a line. But I think when you compare two like really disparate examples, like Richard Spencer, and then say someone who like actually has um, maybe just a disagreeable political agenda, then there is a distinct line in between. And who gets to decide that line? The government, right? Yeah. Right. And if the government thinks that oh my God, you're criticizing my policies, you don't get to speak because I'm the government, then you're upset. Just think about it, Henry. Um, I just wanted to, I think, what I think is encompassed by like, the quotation at the end of the reading from Home Care. Um, I, do, I do not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend um, to the death of the right to say it. I totally agree with that. Um, regardless, regardless of the content. Regardless of the content. Right. Okay. And like, regarding like, the money and like, how expensive it is to have all these speakers come, um, it, I think the person in the right is sort of priceless. So um, I don't think the groups inviting the people, um, inviting the speakers to be responsible for paying for it. It's the government's responsibility to. Um, yeah, but you see, in this government. context, in the Berkeley context, you are the person paying for it. You are paying for it. All of you are paying for it. Maybe that's okay. Okay, and I'm not suggesting it is or isn't okay. What I'm having you consider is that it's easy to say the other person should pay for it, but in this case, it's you. Are you okay to pay for this? Are you okay to pay the half a million dollars that the estimate would have been to protect a Richard Spencer or a Miles Yiannopoulos or Ann Coulter or any of those people? Are you okay to do that? Maybe you are. It's not protecting those people. It's protecting the right of them to say the good. Right. So you're it's protecting not, it's this not protecting their ideas, it's protecting their right to say these things. Okay. And as an administrator, as a government, <laughs> as someone with the power to decide whether or not somebody walks on campus to speak or not, is there any limitations that you would place on a speaker based upon the content of the speech? I would look to Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire right. and the fighting words. Go ahead. And? Um, say I'm like, I'm so kind of confused by it, but I think that prohibiting speech based on fighting words for is context based, but um, I do agree with it. Um, so there is some content that you would look to to limit a speaker. I forget if this case is in advance, but I think it goes back to what she was saying before, in that, like... Well, just to review for everybody, Chaplinsky, someone went up to someone, actually screamed at them directly and threatened them, and the government said, you can arrest that person for disturbing the peace because it's going to incite violence. Any rational human being would react violently. <coughs> I would suggest to you that if Spencer gets to speak on Berkeley campus, it's pretty predictable that somebody's going to get really, really upset and probably throw a brick through a window. The reason why I know that is because it's happened already. It happened with my life, right? It happened. We know it, it cost a lot of money to repair the window that was broken. There's a lot of violence. We know it's going to happen. My question is, you can't honestly and legitimately say, I think. We don't know what the reaction is going to be. We have to let this person speak because I think you don't know what the reaction is going to be, and you've seen it. That's not the fair question. I think the fair question is, we know what that reaction is going to be. And Spencer, or Milo, or Ann Coulter, didn't just decide one day, I think I'm going to walk on campus and talk. That person was invited by a genuinely legitimate, honest group of students of Berkeley just like you. Because whatever the reason is, they wanted to hear the words spoken by that person. We know what the reaction is going to be. We've been told and we've seen it. The question that you have to decide is you are now the government. You are now the person in charge of Cal. You now get to decide whether you let that person on campus or not. What do you decide? What do you do? You let them on or not? Because that's the issue. Do you? you let them on. And you spend the money necessary to protect the speaker. And you arrest the people who throw the brick through the window. Okay, and when that person is heckled, because you know that person's going to be heckled, it's not like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize somebody in the audience would be upset. What do you do? Do you let them just heckle each other, or do you take the person who's heckling and you bring them out? You take them out. What do you do? Because 
those are the decisions you have to make. And you have to make them in two contexts. One is you've got the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law, which means government shall make no law, and we are the government here. You, you've got to live with that. That's a given. And the second is you know what the response is going to be, and you have to decide what you do about that response. That's the question. Tom? I don't see why you would make a decision based on the fact that like some people like you pay tuition to go to a school. Like if I'm in like this park and then this guy it says some I have the right to be in this park too, right? It's a public place, I can be I have the right to be in this park, right? But so what's the difference between being on a campus? Well, what's you know the difference? No. You don't know the difference? Anybody I can walk in the park, I may not be able to get in the park. And when I go into the park, it's not for a specific necessary purpose. You come here for a specific <coughs> purpose. And I don't pay money to go into the park, and you pay money to come here. And the park commissioner doesn't have an obligation to me to have a nice day, but Berkeley has an obligation to you to give you an education. <coughs> so that's the difference between the park and here. Yeah, but My question is not whether or not there's a distinction. My question is whether or not that distinction is sufficient enough to allow the government to censor speech on Berkeley that it would not have the right to censor in the public square. That's the issue that Berkeley has to face. That's the issue. Also, with regards to the heckler of you know, people yelling over, I think there is a, di there is a difference because, like, um, between what and what? what? Uh, between, like, say, people yeah. like causing violence and, or, and like destroying property and forcing the person to not speak and people just yelling over the speaker. Because, like, causing violence and, and like, threatening the speaker and stuff is illegal and yelling things isn't, so. So how do you decide? What do you do? Speech of a heckler's veto is fine, but. So, really... so Spencer comes on campus and everybody shows up, but people show up and they don't let him speak and they scream and yell and make a lot of noise and he cannot communicate. You just let it happen. Yeah. You do. Yeah. And, and if there is violence, you arrest the violent people. Yeah. And so you're really allowing a majority to censor a minority, aren't you? Think about it. Yeah. So, um, I have a few quick things to say. First of all, you take the heckler out because no matter if they're throwing a rock at the speaker or they're speaking so loud that you can no longer hear them, they're doing what they want to do. They're stopping that person from speaking. And, you know, at the end of the day, the government has the role of protecting that speaker to speak against a majority. Um, and then also, there is something said about. Um, if you know what the speaker can come, and I think that whole idea is really ridiculous, even if you know what they're gonna say, even if you think their words might incite violence at the end of the day, people are still responsible for their actions. Someone can say anything they want to you, and if you decide to throw a rock or instigate violence, that's like that's your fault, and the government has to like stop that from happening. Um, and I think we kind of, I don't know, it hasn't really been mentioned, but like people are so responsible for their actions. Like even like the worst possible thing that someone can say, and I'm not going to minimize these speakers are horrible and what they have to say is oftentimes to incite, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be allowed to say it. And also I think that like the idea that the government should be allowed to draw the line on what content you can say and you cannot say, it can't be made. And because it can't be made, you cannot side on the side that's like, you know, overly cautious. You have to kind of look, let it happen and then follow suit because there, you cannot draw that line. So let me unpack this a little bit. I don't think anybody thinks that if you don't like a speaker, you have the right to throw a rock at that person. Right, right. So That's fine. That's I put that over big there. Example. <laughs> but here you have a speaker and the speaker is being effectively denied his or her right to speak. Right. Because of other people's speech. Yes. Right. The question is, what's the role of the government? The role of the government is to protect the speaker. Well, let's see, but that begs the question: How do you protect the speaker? Well, you let the hecklers heckle. The their speaker. intent <laughs> is to silence, whether they're like physically silencing them or literally speaking over them so loudly or yelling slurs at them that aren't threatening their life but are still like, like they're not being able to speak anymore. Their words are being shut down because people don't want to hear them. And this whole system is set up to now allow people to be in their own echo chamber. And whenever they don't like something, they just silence it. And okay. like, so you've got a heckler in the audience standing yeah. up screaming. What if the government did it? 
removes the heckler. So aren't you limiting that person's right to speak? No, they can still speak, they just can't and stop someone there. else's right because they're stopping someone else's speech. All right, so any speech that stops someone else's speech, the government's responsibility is to stop the heckler. So isn't it a function of who gets to speak first, that person who gets protected and the person who speaks second doesn't? Kind of, yeah. Are you okay with that? Maybe you are okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't be okay with yeah. it. I'm just suggesting just that, that if that's the rule, then that's the rule. That's what happens. I just think we all know what they're trying to do. At the end of the day, they don't want to hear the speech. It's not like they're trying to voice their opinion. If they want to have like an actual conversation about it, you know, like there are more reasonable ways to do that than to speak so loudly that you can't hear the speaker. And there's like a like. I don't know where you draw the line, but there is a line between someone trying to inhibit someone's speech. You see, but that's the problem, and that is that somebody so, has to actually draw because the Because you can't draw the line and say, oh, if your voice is this many octaves, then like you need to leave. Like if someone's trying, you know, you just remove them. So Let I everyone think, else have the right to hear them. So your answer is, and maybe that's the right answer, is that because it's almost impossible, if not really impossible, to draw a line you don't draw. Yeah. And you don't let the government draw. Right, and they and, shouldn't. And yeah. speech is just spoken. You allow the speech regardless of content. Yes. And it's the government's role to protect the yes. speech. Period, full stop. Correct. We move on. We yes. have no problem. That's it. I mean, we have problems, but yes. <laughs> but, but we have problems, but we don't have a governmental First Amendment problem. Yes. Okay. Um, I was going to say it's not about who starts speaking first. It's who has a book, the venue, and that's who has the right to speech. Who has been invited on campus? <laughs> talk to the administration and book the specific venue so they can share their own viewpoint. That's who has the right to speech. That's why they have more right to say whatever they want rather than not heckle in the audience. Okay, I'll grant that point. What happens if the announcement that comes out just rolls and stands up on a soapbox and he's heckled? Now what? Then the uh, administration can't do anything. I mean, so that's, that's just a free-for-all. That's in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you can follow somebody around and heckle them and shut them up. I mean, if it's a pattern of harassing one person over and over again, well, that's not it's, not it's not harassing. I mean, the facts are, Spencer stands up on a soapbox and scroll past and speak. <laughs> you can't do anything like to prevent people from. So there is a heckler's veto, which you're okay with. So people's right to speak depends upon how it lands on somebody else. Um, Maybe that's okay, but what I'm, what I'm asking you to take in is that if you say that, which you can, then what you're also saying is that people's speech depends upon how it lands on the listen. Maybe that's okay, but that's what you're saying. That's what we call a heckler's veto. Maybe it's okay, but allow yourself to take in the notion that if you make that right change on a revolution, that's it. So let me tell you my view about it. Any last comments? Okay, thank you. I have papers for people and we'll see you on the next